So thankful that all of you have chosen to make part of your Christmas traditions here with us. I didn't even think about uh, traditions. I mean, I'm sure we all have our Christmas traditions that we try to do or or do. They're every year. They either just happen naturally, or we just get around to them, or uh, we don't even realize that we do them. They're like a tradition that that's kind of almost silent. You have those. I have one that I didn't sign up for, but it's just part of my life. It happened because thanks to my parents. You know how they do it. So a big Terlecki tradition in growing up in my household was that we opened. Christmas gifts, but we open them very slowly. Maybe you're kind of, you know it, kind of, yeah, okay. But this is how slow it was. We had to cut the tape lines with a pocket knife. We were, hey, hey, I'm not complaining. I got a pocket knife when I was a kid. You know, that's great. But then we had to go really slowly cut and make sure that we cut the tape lines because why? Got to save the paper. Got to save the paper. So we fold that nice and neatly, package that for next year. And it's, you get used to it. You're like, you know what paper came. Like, you, oh, man, this is a vintage, you know, 1993. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? But there were six of us. And we'd also go around one at a time opening gifts. So, I mean, this is, I, I, I want to help you understand this. So uh, let me just explain. I'm going to show it to you, okay, instead of just explaining it to you. So my wife wrapped some gifts for me tonight. Um, which one should I open? The, the big one? A big one? All right, here we go. No, I'll do the little one. I'll do the little one. <laughs> I, I remove your expectations, right? Okay, hold on a second. Let me, let me just show you how it's like. So it's like this. Oh, hold on. Light, here we go. No, I know. You're thinking like, Rick, you're just taking your time. But <laughs> I, I, I do not want to anger my mom right now because I, I feel it already tightening. Okay, there we go. Now, you're like probably anticipating, you're like, what is inside of this thing, right? What, it, what, what could it be? And uh, that's good. I'm glad you're anticipating this gift. But just imagine that it was 18 in already, okay? Uh, <clears throat> I kid you not, Christmas Day took three days at my household. Uh, we would stop, break for lunch. You know how that goes, right? Yeah? No, you didn't do that? You break for lunch after three gifts each? No? Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right, here we go. Yes, I actually, I'm curious what Michelle put it here. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, oh, look at that. Already, already. Oh. Michelle, that's an inside joke. You got to watch last week's sermon to be able to understand what's going on there with that. Now, um, my father, clinical psychologist, rigorously taking notes in the corner of the room, you know something's up when he's testing us like this, right? He's just like, he's having his fun. My brother, though, on the other hand, he was smart enough to figure things out. So what he would do is he pre-cut all the gifts, right? While we're going around, we're distracted. He's got all his lines cut by the time it gets to him. Whoosh, look at it. I already know what it is. Done, right? He knew. He knew it was up. This is how I grew up. And so what, what happened the moment, moment I had kids? My family experience, what did I do? Oh, uh, go ahead, kids. Rip it to shreds. I don't care. Go for it, right? I was being very reactive to how I was raised. Obviously, though, a couple years in, what did I, what did I learn? I don't like this. What's going on? Something's wrong. It doesn't feel right. I wanted my children to experience the generosity they were receiving. Instead, they were just rushing through it all very quickly, going through, ripping out all of it. And there's no means of gratitude. Right? They, what the way that they're doing it is like appreciation is like fleeting. And so they're all, all that matters is as long as there's another gift to open and they're ripping that up, everything's good. But the moment that the gifts are done, what happened? Disappointment. So Christmas ends with disappointment because we rushed so quickly, we didn't even realize, what was all the stuff I get? I don't know, but is there another one to open? We just start handing them boxes, empty boxes. Here, open this. Um, I, I realized, okay, somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle, I gotta go somewhere, dial things back. But what I realized what I really want is that scene out of the Christmas story. Christmas story, the movie. Yes, yes, the dad. Uh, he gives his son the BB gun that he wanted, he always wanted for Christmas. This is the BB gun, of course, that he couldn't have because why? You shoot your eye out, kid. Right, exactly. But his dad gives him something, and as he gives it to him, it, it, you, you, know, you, look, you see the kid in the film, and he's like so excited. He kind of knows what it is, and he's opening it up. But you got to pay attention to the dad, because the dad, his face in the background, that's where we want to be at, because he is so ecstatic 
for his kid. And he's present with his kid. This is what we call showing up. He's with his son every step of the way as he's opening. And he's encouraging him, no, go ahead, keep opening it. Yeah, 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 put this part in. That's how you put this. You know what to do. But then he's also telling his son to slow down. No, no, slow down. Appreciate this part. Enjoy this part. So his dad's with him, present. Whatever happened to being present, right? And I don't mean, by the way, about physically being here. What happened to being present? And I don't mean like just arriving at life, like you just like, well, at least I'm here. We'll see what happens, right? That being reactive or just allowing life to dictate whatever is going to happen to us. I'm talking about awareness. I'm talking about thoughtful engagement. It's, it's partially preparing and being prepared as you arrive to things, but it's, it's still present and not thinking about all the plans and all the things I still have to get done. I want to be patient enough to be present. How do I get there? We are incredibly impatient beings. Yes? Very much so. Yes, can we all agree? Yes. We want, yeah, we want everything now. We want everything now before we lose interest, right? Oh, that looks good. Three weeks later, it's like, I don't know what I was thinking, right? We want it now before we lose interest, and we want to just rush through life, so much so that we're just trying to get to the end, not paying attention that there is an end at the, at the end of all of it. Yet, we seem really good at being slow at some other things. We're really good at being slow to reconcile. We're really good at being slow to forgive others. We're really good at being slow to endure things and finally start to do some of the hardship stuff. We're really good at like, oh, I'll wait till I have to do that, procrastinate if I can. We're very avoidant of the good stuff. And we view patience as it being on our terms. We, we think of God's patience and we think it's exactly the same thing, that it's just momentary, just like ours. Uh, but, but scripture tells us not to overlook this one fact. Don't overlook this one fact, beloved that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. We forget that time is part of God's creation. It's something that he made. It's something that he wields. He views it very differently than we do. We need to become more familiar with the slow patience of God. God has been patient with us from the start. Since the fall, he has been patient. And right away, in our actions, this is through Adam and Eve, uh, we have wronged God. We have placed him in a spot where we've actually rejected him. And we continue to reject him. It's not just we can blame it on the two and say, well, I had nothing. I wasn't there. We, We continue, in our sinful nature, continue to have an attempt to replace God. Because every time we look and we say, we want control, we want to do it our way, what we're saying is we don't need God, we can be God. We make ourselves, and this is how it's phrased, objects of wrath destined for destruction. Ugh, yuck, we hate that, right? Merry Christmas, by the way. <laughs> the word wrath, we, we don't like that word, right? We don't like it because we, we think it too mean. But I think it's because we don't understand what the holiness of God is, the how holy God is, the how set apart he really is from everything else. Putting it simply, the wrath is just God's righteousness responding to unrighteousness. And it's been God's right to pursue and to deliver justice. And I believe that he never stopped, right? but that he didn't rush to it either. He didn't rush in haste to just make everything right. right? Just get justice out of the way. Do it before he loses interest. Right? Just quick to lash out because he feels angry and he just wants to feel better, so he'll just do what he wants in the moment. Now, Scripture tells us that God is slow to anger. If you look in the Old Testament, there's something to be said about how many times we fumble, <laughs> How many times we continually fall short, how we fall short of following God, how short we are in in obeying his word, doing what he tells us to do, and how much we fall short of just honoring him in every moment that he has gifted us. And yet in the Old Testament, we see God continues to faithfully not walk away from us. If someone was giving you a hard time, what would you do? No, thanks. I think I'll part ways and go, go somewhere else. A big one I can think of is it's when God's people, it's his people 
they come and say, we would like to have a human king instead of following you, God, instead of letting you be our leader. That way, we can be like everybody else. We can be like every other nation. Do you know how God responds in that moment? He responds by saying, since I've rescued them from Egypt, they have continued to forsake me and worship false gods. Forsake me. But he gives it to them anyways. He gives them what they want, which actually, in the end, it's not very uh, it, uh, you know, helpful. It proves disastrous, really. And, uh, but what's interesting is that God then uses the thing that they desired that falls apart on them anyways because our ideas aren't that great. And he takes our thing and he uses our thing then to restore us. He promises a king will eventually come in the line of kings whose reign will restore us forever. God promises a savior. But note, he does not negate the justice in doing so. It's because of who he is. He is fully just while at the same exact time, he is also fully love. Not sometimes he's just, right? Sometimes he's, I'm choosing to be just in this moment. And other times he's like, I'll, I'll choose to love in this moment. He is both which means he is a patient God in order to remain both at all times. So why not hurry it along, right? Why did God wait so long to bring about a savior? And, and today, why does he continue to watch me make mistakes and not just make me perfect right now? Because, you know, that's what we're all trying to do, right? Each day, just trying to make ourselves perfect. Well, Second Peter, it continues by saying that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He wants us all to turn back. And if you notice this, slowness and patience, they're not the same thing. Patience is the counter to slowness. And God's not merely slow like he's just getting around to it. And he's not like, well, when I have time on my hands, I'll start putting together the the savior package for you, right? So this means that patience has a purpose, that it's purposeful, that it is a thoughtful, engaging, active, and present thing. Now, Paul made these arguments in Romans, the same thing, when he said, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured much patience with vessels or objects of wrath prepared for destruction. That's you. That's me. In order, in order, he's done that, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. That could be us. Which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Paul urges that the that God's patience is meant to reveal the riches of his kindness towards us so that it leads us to repentance, that it, it leads us to being restored with him so that we can be with him forever. But also, patience doesn't ignore the consequences. It doesn't erase it, the justified punishment. In fact, it, it uses it. It uses it. It disciplines. Now, we, we don't discipline our kids for revenge, Right? Right? Right. (laughs) Because that's not discipline. Right? Discipline is the course correction off the destructive path before it reaches the end. We see where our kids are going. We don't want our kids to head that way. That's danger. Don't go that way. And so what do we do? We rebuke. We correct. We discipline our kids to help them see who they're meant to be. This is who you should be. This is who you were made to be. We want them to value the values that they should value. This is what's right. This is what's true. And we want to help them see the way they should live their life. You know, God does the same. Patience is God pursuing mercy despite prolonging his suffering. He endures being forsaken. I'm willing to take it on, he says so that we may know how much he loves us. His patience, he is patient so that he may provide the justice required. He is satisfying wrath with himself. 
to provide the righteousness needed for our unrighteousness. And from near beginning of time, God has been patient. And in doing so, I think, as we look at Scripture, we can see He has shown Himself to be faithful. This is why in Scripture, this is my favorite in Galatians, when it says, at just the right time, When the set time had fully come, when the fullness of time had arrived, God sent his son. Only then, born of a woman. It was just the right amount of faithfulness. Realize that? All leading up. It's just the right amount of faithfulness for us to understand that our God is faithful. It's just the right amount of times that we have fallen short for us to get it in our head, okay, we can't do it on our own. We, we need a Savior. And it's in just the right amount of time for us to have faith that God will fulfill his promises because he's done it over and over and over again. That's when God sent himself to be with us. And here he is, Jesus. He comes with us in a manger, lowly, Emmanuel, God with us as a baby. Here he is. Here he is. But why? Why a baby? Why not a man? Why don't he just come straight out of heaven, come straight down, go right to the cross? Whoop! Put himself right up on there and go, get it done over with. Let's go. <laughs> right? For the win. Jesus could have been like that. But why? Why, why did he prolong it? Why did he make it even go longer? The, the reason God became a man was to die. His aim was to die. It was to suffer the cross, to be forsaken even further than he was forsaken. He had to take the cost of death, which was for you and for me. So therefore, in order to die, he had to be born. He had to be born. He had to experience the fullness of being a human, of being man, in order to experience death. Jesus needed to experience the fullness of our humanity so he could sympathize with us. So he could, he could understand, he would walk every step that we've walked and be tempted, just like we've been tempted, yet overcome. And he would share in our humanity so that he could relate with us, so that he may provide for us what we cannot provide for ourselves. But there's one thing that's often overlooked, that we overlook about him coming as a baby. It was that he came so he could be patient with us, which means to take time to be thoughtfully engaged and present with us. You realize a baby's going nowhere. You realize that, right? Here they are. They don't get to walk up and, well, see you. Right? They're dependent on us. They're dependent on being present with us. So even for those first few days, first few months and first few years, Jesus is sitting there present with Mary, Joseph, and even the wise men who have been searching for that promised king. And they can come and they can sit and they can be with and then they can say, here is our king. Here and now, he is present. And it displays his patience so that we may learn to let him lead us. Lead us. Lead us into being fully restored, being made anew with God. And even as Jesus left us with his spirit, after he rose from the grave, He left us his spirit so that what? He could be with us, that we could experience his presence like we've never experienced before. And today, he's with you. I assure you, he is with you, tugging, working on you, disciplining you, whether you realize it or not, present with you so that you may understand that our king is patient with us. That He's here and now he's leading us. He's leading somewhere, and he's gentle with us, too. He's gentle with us, and he's redeeming us if we would just simply listen. If you got a bulletin, um, it reminds me of, of Luke 10. I just want to read that passage with you. It's really where Jesus shows this is that here in, he's heading towards a village, and in the village there's a woman named Martha. And Martha uh, has a house, and she welcomes Jesus in. Come in, Jesus. And she has a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Here's what we can learn from Mary. Come to the feet of Jesus. It's a good place to be. It's a good place to be present. Come to the feet of Jesus. 
but then be present and be attentive to his word because he's teaching you something. You realize Jesus, is te- he has something for you. He's taking you somewhere, somewhere that you are meant to be if you'd simply listen. But Martha was distracted with much serving. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her and said, Martha, Martha. That's an endearing term, by the way. It is so gentle. Jesus is speaking so gently with her. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. All that cooking you need to get done, those cookies that are still in the oven, the stockings that still need to be filled. Slow down. Be present. Be patient. You're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary, Jesus says. One thing is necessary. Of all things, what's the thing that's necessary? To be present with Jesus. Sit at my feet. Listen. I'm teaching you. This is what's called the good portion, as Scripture talks about. Because Jesus says to Martha, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. You realize there's many portions in life? There's, there's many portions, many aspects to faith, to your, to your life. All the things you got going on, they all require your attention. Um, they require their responsibilities that have been given to you. Some are hardship, some are joyful but they've all been entrusted to you and they need our activation. But there's a good portion greater than anything else. It is the presence of being with your king. Take a second, just pause. Close your eyes. It's Christmas Eve. Don't worry, Christmas will arrive tomorrow. It's okay. (laughs) Just pause. Can you be present right now with your king? Because He is paused. He is present with you with full grace, with full mercy, with full justice. He is here, here and now with you.